Yeah, thanks, KT. Um, yeah, so KT didn't um, introduce herself, but uh, she's the campaign organizer for Breathe Free Detroit, and I've been working with her on organizing this webinar for some time now, so I'm really thankful for her support throughout this process. Um, I'm, I'm going to quickly introduce myself. Um, I'm Kat Diggs. I'm, I use she, her pronouns, and I am um, currently a dual master's degree at the University of Michigan, pursuing a master's degree in environmental justice at the School for Environment and Sustainability and a Master of Urban and Regional Planning at Taubman College. Um, prior to going to grad school, I spent seven and a half years away from academic study, five of which were spent in Detroit, uh, Michigan. I'm originally from Montreal, Quebec. Um, I worked at um, Detroit's only public recycling drop-off center that's remaining in the city, um, Recycle Here, for five years. And that's really where I got involved with the um, with the waste justice movement at large. Um, and through U of M, I was able to um, garner some funding to start working with um, the Global Alliance for Incinerator Alternatives, um, which is a really amazing organization. I'm really thankful to be in orbit with them. Um, so I'll share my screen and, and quickly introduce you all to our uh, esteemed panelists for today. Um, so just give me one quick moment. Um, yeah, so just so you all are a little bit in context before we actually dive into um, everyone's presentations, the, the core, the kind of core of this whole um, webinar today is really discussing um, the Motor City's potential to reach net negative waste sector emissions by 2030 through zero waste strategies, which is um, uh, which we'll be putting in context throughout this webinar. Um, and so for our panelists today, I'm going to start by uh, speaking of Neil Tangri, who's the Science and Policy Director of the Global Alliance for Incinerator Alternatives. Um, Neil is a founding member of Gaia um, and has worked on international environmental policy, climate, and development finance and provided technical support to Gaia members. Neil is part of the core leadership team at Gaia, um, leading the charge on the Alliance's efforts surrounding the global plastics treaty negotiations that are currently happening as well as um, research projects on climate benefits of zero waste systems, methane reduction, and debunking false solutions, including waste to energy incineration and so-called chemical recycling. Neil has a captain's license from the US Coast Guard and a PhD from Stanford University. Um, so Neil will be our first presenter, but I'll um, run through the other panelists first. Um, our panelists after that will be Sandra Turner Handy, who's the senior policy advisor to the president for uh, the Michigan Environmental Council. Uh, Sandra is a lifelong Detroiter and is the mother of six children, 11 grandchildren, and one great grandson. Sandra is a graduate of Wayne State University with a Bachelor of Science in Psychology and a Master of Science in Leadership Development. She is currently completing a Doctorate of Education in Leadership Development. Sandra has worked in the political arena as a Chief of Staff for Representative and Senator Hanson Clark. It is um, this position that has motivated her work and engage, an engagement in the areas of social and environmental justice in the city of Detroit. Sandra has found her niche in the sphere of community engagement and has fought relentlessly over the years to raise the quality of life of Detroit residents. Sandra is the engagement director for the Michigan Environmental Council as well, and she has worked there for the past 12 years. Um, S Sandra currently sits on a number of boards and coalitions whose goals are to mitigate the impact of environmental damage as well as to improve Detroiters' health and their built environment through programs and policy changes. She enjoys reading, landscaping, writing, mentoring youth leaders, and working on beautification products, projects in her community. Um, so thanks for joining us today, Sandra. Um, I'll then be speaking about Renee V. Wallace, um, who has the privilege of leading three entrepreneurial entities, Doors Edge LLC as the CEO, Food Plus Detroit as the executive director and Remark Composting Solutions as the co-founder and CEO president. She is committed to advancing composting as a source of community resourcefulness and resiliency and has a body of concentrated work in Detroit and the state of Michigan. At the local level, she leads Food Plus Detroit's People's Compost Initiative, is a member of the Detroit City Council Green Task Force community and a founding member of the Organics Recycling Committee. Um, a community engagement team member of Detroit's climate strategy and a member of the Composting for Community Health Pilot Project funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which is designed to inform policy change through community scale practice with a focus on climate and health. So Renee will be speaking more about that today. At the state level, she is a member of the Michigan Organics Council, 
Michigan chapter is a Michigan Next Cycle, Mich sorry, a Michigan Next Cycle Initiative Ambassador, Innovation Track Application Reviewer, and a member of the DEI team, and is leading engagement of alumni of the Great Lakes Leadership Academy and supporting composting actions in the Michigan Healthy Climate Plan. And finally, at the national level, she is a member of the USCC and chair of its DEI training subcommittee and is the compost lead for the NRDC Great Lakes Cohort Detroit team. Um, so Renee has, has, has a lot of accolades and we're really happy to have her with us today. Um, and Renee also has a lot of experience as a change manager, business process consultant, um, and facilitator. Um, and I will wrap up our introductions with um, introducing you all to Madison Cross, also um, goes by Maddie. Uh, Maddie is the recycling coordinator for the city of Detroit's Department of Public Works. We're really happy to have her with us today. She has a BS in neuroscience from Michigan State University and a master's of the environment and sustainability planning and management from the University of Colorado Boulder. Maddie is the chair of the Detroit City Council's Green Task Force Construction and Demolition Subcommittee, a true zero waste advisor and formerly the director of community engagement at um, a local nonprofit in Detroit called Green Living Science. Um, so with that, I will pass it off to Neil to speak to the larger report in which the Detroit case study um, is housed. Great, thank you so much. Um, I hopefully have succeeded in sharing my screen with you. Um, it's an honor to be here. Thank you all very much for sharing your afternoon, evening, um, with us, and I'm happy to, um, yeah, happy to be here and and talk a little bit about the work that we've been doing. Um, I'll just say uh, a couple of words about Gaia first. For those of you uh, who aren't familiar, we're um, a global network of over a thousand grassroots groups and NGOs in 92 countries, and our members are all working towards zero waste. And they often combine this work with other related programs such as environmental justice agroecology, waste picker work, uh, and more. So that's a little bit about who we are. Um, this report that Kat just referred to is, is called Zero Waste to Zero Emissions. Uh, we spent much of last year working on this really detailed report. Um, and it is uh, an attempt to draw together all the different strands in, in which zero waste can, um, can work on climate. And at the heart of it is a modeling analysis of eight cities. Um, and I will just give you the punchline right up front in case any of you um, don't want to hear my voice any longer. Zero waste can have a huge impact on in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we, we calculated an estimate of 1.4 billion tons of carbon dioxide equivalent each year. That would be like taking all of the cars in the US fleet off the road. So quite impactful. So how does zero waste tackle climate change? Well, um, there's a few different ways. Um, the biggest impact actually comes from reducing landfill methane. So methane is a greenhouse gas. Uh, it traps 82 times as much heat as carbon dioxide, if you measure it over 20 years, but it only lasts an average of 12 years in the atmosphere, which means that when we reduce methane emissions, we can reduce the methane load in the atmosphere very quickly, and that becomes the fastest way to put the brakes on global warming. This is why there's a lot of attention right now internationally on methane emissions as the kind of the, the lowest hanging fruit, the easiest way to reduce uh, climate change. It's not an alternative to reducing carbon dioxide emissions. It's a complement. We need to do both. And methane in the waste sector comes basically from organics, that's mostly food waste that have been landfilled. So composting is our secret weapon to really dramatically reduce methane emissions. Um, and that's the, the biggest one, but that is only the tip of the wasteberg, so to speak. So if we look upstream, we see that there are additional benefits. Um, recycling and upstream source reduction are also really core strategies in zero waste. And those reduce emissions throughout the economy, in manufacturing, in agriculture, in mining, in transportation, in lots of sectors outside the waste sector. What that means is that when we have high levels of source reduction and recycling, and we couple it with composting, 
zero waste can actually reduce emissions greater than the total emissions in the waste sector. And it's doing that by reducing emissions in other sectors. And we, sometimes you hear people talk about a net negative sector. This is what we're talking about. So all of these numbers, as I mentioned, come from uh, a modeling analysis that we did of eight very different cities around the world. We chose these cities to get as diverse a set as we could. These are wealthy cities, poor cities, cities in the global south and the global north. Um, they're cities that have highly advanced waste management systems and some cities that have almost no waste management systems. Very, very different cities, very different climates, societies, cultures. And what we found is that in every one of these cities, zero waste can dramatically reduce greenhouse gas emissions, which means if it can work in all of these places, it can really work anywhere. So one of our eight cities, of course, is Detroit. I'm going to let the Detroiters speak specifically about um, our interventions there, but I wanted to give you a, a sense of the kind of global context there. Um, one of the nice things about zero waste is that it is not only a mitigation strategy. You all will know when it comes to climate change, mitigation refers to reducing emissions, but that's not the only battle. We also have to think about adaptation. The, the climate is changing. It's affecting all of us. We need to adapt to it. And zero waste actually can help cities adapt to climate change. To take one example, um, climate change is already exacerbating both flooding and drought, uh, which seems contradictory, but it's this wet gets wetter, poor get poorer kind of syndrome. Um, a major contributor to urban flooding is plastic, which accumulates in drainage, um, blocks drains, um, and, and aggravates flooding. So bans on single-use plastics and plastic bags are really cost-effective tools to reduce the flooding that's coming with climate change. On the other side, the compost, again, compost, our secret weapon here, when it gets applied to land, it helps improve the soil structure, which means that it's better able to retain and absorb water. So that means that when you get a downpour, less of it comes out in runoff because more of it's getting absorbed. And if you're suffering through a drought, your soils are healthier and better able to retain water and, and preserve the drought. And then there are others such as um, reducing uh, disease vectors and things like that. But zero waste is, while we think of it primarily as mitigation, um, it's also an adaptation strategy. And then there are all kinds of additional benefits. You know, as climate activists, we sometimes get stuck on the numbers, particularly on mitigation. And as important as those emissions reductions are, we cannot lose sight of the larger system, right? The, the larger society that we're talking about. So it's important to look at what are what the, the co-benefits of zero waste. And these are really important in part because they build political support. And um, this is obviously important if we want to get policies passed. So I'm only going to call out one here. This is from a, a publication that we did last year, which is about jobs. Right. We did a meta-analysis of all the existing um, studies that we could find in the literature that looked at job creation um, potential of, um, of different waste systems. And we found that zero waste systems create 10 to 60 times as many jobs as disposal-based systems like landfills and incinerators. Right. right now, okay, in the US, we have a tight job market. But even so, there are significant populations who are underrepresented in the job market and unemployed. And so I think job creation is always something that's gonna be important for us. Um, so takeaways, I'm on a very short time budget here, so I'm gonna end quickly. Um, takeaways here, one, composting is really a climate game changer. Um, the, the keeping the organic waste out of the landfill is really critical. And the best way to do this is to implement source separation of organic waste. Then the organics can be composted. There are other treatment methods available for, um, for organics. There's anaerobic digestion and there's animal feed and a variety of other things. But for most cities, composting is um, the easiest, the most practical and, um, and the cheapest approach. And even moderate success with this strategy delivers transformative results. We saw a 62% reduction in landfill gas production 
And when combined with high levels of recycling, emission reductions can go as high as 105%. Again, that's counting emissions that are reduced in other sectors. So that's one takeaway. Um, the other takeaway won't be a surprise to any of you here. It's that source reduction uh, is really the most powerful tool we have to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. That is especially true for food waste and for plastic. Plastic, the majority of emissions for plastic are upstream when the plastic is being produced. And so even better recycling or better collection, keeping it out of the drains is really not enough to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We have to go after the production end. And so source reduction is really powerful here. We have a number of other key takeaways um, on the mitigation side, adaptation and co-benefits. Of course, I would encourage you to read the report. Um, oh, whoop, I had another one here. It's um, it's uh, energy recovery is not an effective mitigation strategy. Now I know you in Detroit, you've closed your incinerator, congratulations. Um, but we found that even cities that have uh, continued to work with their incinerators, um, those incinerators do not produce enough energy to make a dent in the problem. And so waste to energy is really not um, an appropriate or a particularly effective mitigation strategy. So again, I would encourage you to, um, to download the report from our website. Um, there's the link there, it's noburn.org, zero waste, zero emissions. And with that, I will hand it over to Kat. Thank you. Thanks so much, Neil, for um, always presenting really complex information in such an accessible way. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll be speaking um, to the work that I did on the Detroit case study, um, which will kind of contextualize Sandra, Renee, and Maddie's uh, presentations afterwards. Um, so with that, um, I'll get us started because I'm also running on a, a rather short timeline. Um, so just to reiterate um, that the, the, the key finding for the Detroit case study through the calculations that Neil uh, ran, so I'm gonna put it in presenter mode, is that Detroit has a potential for net negative uh, waste sector emissions by 2030 through zero waste strategies. So pretty encouraging findings. Um, and so just before diving in, like why, why would a Montrealer uh, be um, you know, tasked with writing a case study on Detroit um, I, I just want to preface that, um, you know, my relationship to the movement really started at, at Recycle Here, where I was an education coordinator for five years. Um, and that's really where, um, you know, I learned about the incinerator. I learned about the environmental injustices of the waste system um, on a more personal basis. Um, and it was through the recycling crisis in 2018 that started with uh, the national sword policy that was passed in China um, that, you know, rightfully banned the imports of, of scrap uh, recyclables from the global north um, to China that really kind of brought the industry to a screeching halt in, in the global north and, and our, our program was, was no exception. We almost shut our doors, but because we've been community-based since 2007, which is when Matt Namey, who you see in this photo here, founded the program, um, we were able to keep our doors open, but that's really because we, we've been doing um, work from a community-based perspective for a long time. Um, but there was really no opportunities for me to be more fully involved in this movement at the time. And so I transitioned to working for a local environmental justice organization before starting my, uh, my graduate program and was lucky enough to get connected with Gaia, whom I had respected their work for a few years before uh, starting to intern with them. Um, so with that, um, I wanted to speak a little bit more to the overarching structure of the Detroit case study, which I was brought on to write um, as they were preparing to finalize their uh, zero waste to zero emissions report. Um, and KT or, or whoever is, is willing, because I don't think I can do that while I share my screen, there's a short version of the case study that was published in October, along with the rest of the case studies in the report at large. And then there's the longer version of the case study that I kind of continued working on after publication to get it finalized and published. And it was actually just published last week on the website. So that was a pretty big milestone for me. Um, but largely the structure of the, the long and the short, but mostly the long is that we really kind of start with a history of Detroit's waste management and diversion landscapes. Um, then we really get into the data component of the case study. Um, so the waste related greenhouse gas emissions and the reduction potential through a zero waste scenario, um, community recommendations for a zero waste Detroit by 2030, how to get there, 
um, a few case studies of grassroots zero waste initiatives in the city, and then an inventory of Detroit's waste diversion uh, systems, which are, are, are pretty complex and compartmentalized in a lot of ways. Um, so my the overarching methodology behind my building this case study was first and foremost extensive data collection efforts in partnership with Maddie, <laughs> who I'm sure has vivid memories of how many emails and phone calls we have exchanged to get the data um, for this case study. Um, so, and Maddie will speak to this more, but but it, it, the, the data is just not that readily available. Um, and I also see that David Refkin from uh, Resource Recycling Systems is here. I also work closely with him and Renee as well, just because we didn't have, we, we didn't have uh, waste generation by type readily available to run our calculations for, for this case study. And so it was really a pretty extensive process um, that both required working with institutions and grassroots organizations. Um, from the recommendation standpoint of the case study, um, I held three visioning sessions over the summer with 15 plus community leaders who represented like a plethora of different aspects of advocating for zero waste in Detroit. Um, I did one-on-one -on -one interviews and gray literature review of just different reports and different uh, you know, efforts that have been carried out in Detroit over the years. Um, and then overall to gather all this grassroots data, all these visions, um, I engaged about 40, 40 plus community stakeholders across Detroit. So this is a, a, a very extensive community-based process and I'm really honored to have been part of this process, um, which is leading us to, to this webinar today. Um, so just kind of giving a really high level um, you know, breakdown and, and Sandra will speak to this more in depth, um, but Detroit was home to one of the largest municipal waste incinerators in the US until it shut its doors in 2019. Um, it was the last major metropolitan city in the US to implement a citywide curbside recycling program in, in 2015 officially. I um, mean, it was only rolled out to, to um, sorry, to single family households. And so the city has been working with uh, grassroots nonprofits like Zero Waste Detroit and Green Living Science to expand access to the program to multifamily buildings, businesses, public spaces. Maddie will be able to speak to this more. Um, but to keep in mind that despite the fact that the incinerator shut its doors, which was a huge environmental justice victory, Detroit has continued to be overburdened by polluting facilities, including two household hazardous waste plants, which are located quite close to each other that are ran by a company called US Ecology. Um, something to also keep in mind is the Detroit Sustainability Action Agenda, uh, which was published by um, the city's Office of Sustainability, which was founded in 2017 declares a goal of increasing its diversion rate from 4%, which is where the city is currently at, to 29% by 2030. But through the visioning process um, over in the summer, we, we, I think community groups wanna see a more aggressive increase in that diversion rate in the next um, seven or so years. Um, and also just keeping in mind that in general, none of these conversations would even be happening without the grassroots in Detroit. And so really keeping in mind that, you know, it took 20 plus years of advocacy um, to, to get to this point where, where we're starting to move forward more significantly on these solutions. Um, and you can see some key statistics here on the far left. I won't, I won't get too much in, into the weeds with those, but um, we're currently at a 38% uh, recycling participation rate, which Maddie might be able to explain a little bit more um, how, how that rate actually works. Um, sorry, I keep <laughs> trying to click ahead. Um, so for, for the calculations, um, Neil was really the person to compile the data. And so he, he has a lot more like um, insights on, on the intricacies of what it took to do this. But um, from a high level perspective, essentially what was decided is that each city would be positioned in the future in 2030, and there would be a business as usual approach, which would use um, the estimated emissions for the waste sector based on data collected for a baseline year. In Detroit's case, it was 2021. Um, and those would be projected to 2030 with, with no changes made, no policies implemented, um, no increase in diversion rates. So you can see those displayed in this chart in red. Um, and then you have the road to zero waste approach, which is one in which um, aggressive zero waste policies would be implemented. And you can just see from the green, on, uh, the green bars on the chart just how significant the emission reduction potential is. Um, and so some really high level key takeaways from the calculations, which are also featured in the case study, um, is that methane from landfill organic waste is the major source of greenhouse gas emissions for Detroit's waste sector as it currently stands. Um, and in a 2030 road to zero waste scenario, the overall diversion rate would, would go from 4% to 
to 59%, and that includes um, an 80% um, diversion of you know, more easy to divert materials like glass, paper, metal, organics, um, combined with 15% for more difficult to recycle materials like electronics, textiles, and plastics, which would bring us up to a 59% diversion rate. Um, and with that, 385,747 tons of CO2 could be avoided, which is the equivalent of you know, close to 49,000 homes of energy use for one year. Um, so this approach at large would reduce overall greenhouse gas emissions by 102% for the waste sector in Detroit compared to a business as usual scenario, which is really significant. Um, but keeping in mind that for these just transitions to happen um, towards a more zero waste systems, generational inequities and injustices will have to be addressed kind of in, in a like intersectional way for this to be possible, like access to affordable housing, um, access to basic amenities like water and electricity, like all these things will need to happen for transition to zero waste to be truly equitable and sustainable. Um, so just kind of merging into the community recommendations to get us to this more just zero waste future in 2030. Um, a lot of what came up during the visioning sessions was a need to increase city leadership and engagement to promote zero waste. Um, I gave a few examples here. Um, it's one is obviously more effective tracking of Detroit's waste streams. Um, Resource Recycling System and Next Cycle Michigan have been really instrumental in helping DPW do this, but I think increased transparency is needed. Um, construction and demolition waste should be accounted for, um, which it currently isn't in a direct way. Uh, there needs to be increased staff capacity and investment in waste diversion infrastructure. From a public awareness standpoint, there's been so much happening already at the local level through nonprofits like Zero Waste Detroit, uh, Green Living Science, Breathe Free Detroit, and so many other incredible groups um, like Renee's Food Plus Detroit. But there needs to obviously be, again, more, more um, capacity needs to be built in those areas. Um, one key thing that came up is mandating climate and zero waste curriculum in Detroit public schools. So really starting with the youth, um, further developing park ambassador programs and litter prevention programs, um, and increasing outreach to residents so that they have a better sense of how to properly sort their materials at home. Um, increasing Detroit's re recycling diversion rate would really kind of involve making recycling universally, universally accessible in Detroit by 2030, uh, reducing contamination in general. And I think that does involve having drop-off locations like Recycle Here to kind of bridge the gap for more difficult to recycle materials like glass. Um, and other things like film plastic um, and increasing local MRF and drop-off capacity across the city in general. Um, from a food rescue capacity perspective, one key thing that came up is implementing a more centralized food donation system like they have in Milan, Italy. So it becomes easier for nonprofits to kind of merge at the center in order to rescue and redistribute more, more food at the, at the city level. Um, there's been some major shifts at the policy front, which I won't be able to speak to as much in depth as maybe some of the panelists today, but I think some key roadblocks that need to be overcome is increasing landfill tipping fees in Michigan because Michigan has some of the lowest fees in the country, which incentivizes landfilling. Um, no longer providing renewable energy credits to waste to energy facilities like um, incinerators and chemical recycling plants. Um, lifting the ban on the ban on single-use plastics is instrumental to moving us towards um, more stringent regulation on single-use plastics. Um, implementing a citywide integrated network of multi-scale compost systems. So I won't dive into this one because Renee will speak to this more at length. Uh, building microcircular economies. So creating nonprofit trading posts, reusable container programs for local restaurants, um, and hyper-local delivery systems for local goods, which would really generate a lot of jobs at the local level. Um, and also utilizing some of the already existing matching funds that the uh, state's next, next cycle Michigan program is, um, is leveraging to help build capacity in these different arenas. Um, and so I'll just kind of wrap us up by just reemphasizing the power of the grassroots movement in Detroit and the fact that a lot of these movement, a lot of these conversations wouldn't have been possible without all this, um, you know, grassroots advocacy. And so we have like just a wide variety from our, our drop off recycling program to our composting for community health, all the environmental justice advocacy happening to hold polluters accountable, the anti incineration struggle that went on for 40 years, um, and just different community based litter and youth education uh, programs as well. Which concludes me on the side of our, you know, waste diversion landscape, which is pretty. Um, 
syncopated in that you know 4% is declared by the city and you can see which different entities are included in that diversion rate, but then you have all the other folks, all the other entities throughout the city that are diverting materials that aren't being declared by the city. Um, and I, there's a full inventory in the case study. I won't get super into it, but it's really a wide variety of efforts from like events recycling, upcycling, food rescue. Um, it's really pretty incredible. And this 2,500 tons is, is probably an underestimate. And it was really just me collecting individual data and just doing basic uh, basic math to get to this figure. So I think you know building capacity for this to be more streamlined and systematic would be uh, really important. And not to forget that there's all the educational policy and advocacy efforts happening as well. And um, litter pickup and prevention is also huge in Detroit. So feel free to explore those more in depth in the case study. Um, I think I think I might be running short on time, so I'm going to skip over the slide so that I can give other folks the time they need to present their work. Um, but happy to share my slides after this um, presentation. Um, yeah, so thank you. And I will pass it off to Sandra, who will, be, who will speak to us a little bit more about the history behind all this work. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Kat, so much. A as Neil said, um, waste to energy facilities have never been effective in providing the energy that was needed. And that is especially true with the Detroit incinerator that was operated by so many different operators throughout the years. But in 1989, that is exactly how it was presented to, well, prior to 1989, it was presented to our mayor at the time as a uh, waste to energy facility that would take our solid waste and it would turn it into energy that would be used to heat um, 141 buildings within a three mile radius of downtown Detroit. Um, and we're talking municipal buildings, privately owned buildings, major universities. Uh, and for many years, that's where their source of energy came from was from uh, burning of our solid waste in the city. I had the opportunity to join the fight against the incinerator in 2008. And at the time we, when I say we, uh, about 20 different organizations, environmental, environmental justice organizations, individuals and community groups got together and decided that we would develop a solid waste management plan. And it was called the Solid Waste New Business Model. And that plan laid out a pilot program for recycling in the city of Detroit. As Kat stated earlier, Detroit was, is a major city and we did not have a curbside recycling program. We did have a drop-off recycling program, which was started by Rosedale Recycles, uh, years prior to us even starting this fight against the incinerator. Uh, so our name was the New Business Model for Solid Waste Management. I think I got it right. It was such a long name. Uh, we changed that name to Zero Waste Detroit around 2010, 2011. So we advocated with the city to, to start a recycling program in the city. But our strategy was to start this recycling program as a means to shut down the incinerator. The incinerator, which was a major environmental injustice going on in the, in the center of the city of Detroit, was really impacting the health of residents within the area. We had high respiratory rates, including asthma, uh, we had low income communities surrounding the incinerator. We had uh, elementary schools in those neighborhoods. We had high rate of asthma with the children in those schools. Uh, the incinerator sat at the very intersection of the most, of two of the most traveled freeways in the city of Detroit, which is I-75 and I-94. And at any time of the day, driving down either of those freeways and hitting that intersection, you were likely to encounter the odors from the incinerator, which was a major source of um, 
our high rate of respiratory illnesses, a major source of um, a decrease in the quality of life that residents in the area was living. Um, so the incinerator, built in 1989, waste to energy, burned about 5,000 tons of, of waste per day. But during the whole time of its existence, the incinerator was a constant source of odor violations, a constant source of major toxin emission, emissions. Uh, they incurred fines on a regular basis, especially from uh, the month of April through the month of October. They were uh, fined consistently. It was easier to pay the fine. There was never any enforcement until the later years. Uh, so we advocated to the city, which was part of the oversight committee of the incinerator, which was our Greater Detroit Resource Recovery um, Agency, GIDRA. Uh, GIDRA was, was a panel of um, appointees from the city, the state, Highland Park, and they were to oversee the operations of, of the, and DPW. They were to oversee the operations of the uh, facility because the facility actually privately owned did sit on city owned land, which they leased. Um, so we advocated to Gidra, we went to their meetings, we advocated to our mayors, our consistent mayors, deputy mayors in the Department of Public Works in order to come up with this pilot program, which we were successfully able to implement the pilot program on, on two areas on the east, two areas in the city of Detroit, one on the east side and one on the west side. The pilot program considered to be successful all the long for pilot program, uh, finally wind up going citywide in 2014. Now, the idea is that the more that we recycle, the less solid waste would go to the incinerator. What, the, what Detroit Renewable Power did, and they were the last owners and operators of the incinerator. We had major owners, inclu including Cavanta, which is one of the leading incinerator operators in the world, and they could not make a go of the incinerator. Last owner, Detroit Renewable Power, chose to go to 65% of the trash going to the incinerator did come from the city of Detroit. Renee, I think, uh, Renee, Sandra, I think you muted yourself. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, so I was saying that 65% of the trash, the solid waste going to the incinerator uh, came from the city of Detroit, 35% of it came from the suburbs. The more that we, the more that our outreach coordinators, uh, agencies doing the work, which was Zero Waste Detroit and Green Living Science and educating and doing outreach to get residents in the city to sign up for curbside recycling, the more that they increase signage, the more trash DRP was able to bring in from suburban communities in order for them to burn enough solid waste to make it profitable for them. Um, we were able to get a, con finally able to get a consent judgment against DRP in 2016. That consent judgment allowed for the state to fine DRP $4,500 per day per incident, which was amazing because that had never happened. 
uh, the permits for DRP, I mean, for the incinerator were automatically done. We would have public, public comment, public comment periods, and no matter how many people showed up, how many people commented, the permit had already been okayed and signed for them to continue operating. Uh, at one point, the city of Detroit literally gave DRP um, $4.1 million credit, uh, obsolete, brownfield obsolete credit, uh, which they were supposed to use to help update the facility. But of course, the facility was too old to be updated, um, but they still received the credit. So finally, with other groups coming in, and, and as I said, Zero Waste Detroit, which has been a member of Gaia for, for quite a while, Zero Waste Detroit was, was made up of faith-based organizations, environmental organizations, environmental justice organizations, community groups, uh, individuals, all joining in and, and saying, okay, where do we go now? We have, we have recycling, but this facility continues to operate. So Breathe Free Detroit, which was, was housed along with one of our, our starting members, which was uh, EMIAC, East Michigan um, Environment, EMIAC, <laughs> which was one of our groups. Uh, Breathe Free Detroit, working with some of our other individual groups, decided to advocate to the city again about closing down the incinerator and also to have individual members along with the Great Lakes Environmental Law Center, who's been a, a part of Zero Waste Detroit uh, since our inception, to file lawsuits uh, against the incinerator and against the city of Detroit uh, around operations of the incinerator. So just about the time that those lawsuits were filed, the state of Michigan also filed another consent judgment against the facility. That consent judgment had uh, the incinerator filed a motion against them that they would have to pay 200,000 in fines during any violation. And that's much, much more than that 4,500 per day. And at the time that they that consent judgment went through, the facility said, we're gonna close down. That was in March of 2019. And so once the facility closed down a, a year, two years later, the city of Detroit, the, the facility, DRP, decided at that time that it would end its lease. The lease ran through 2030 up to, I think, about 2035. The DRP decided they were going to end the lease for, uh, for the land. The city and DRP decided that they were going to dismantle the incinerator itself. Um, community was called out to the press conference. No decision had been made about what they were going to do with the uh, land once the incinerator was dismantled. Uh, quite a few of the organizations that were a part of Zero Waste Detroit, Ecology Center, Sierra Club, DWEJ, Green Door Initiative, and others came out. And our suggestion was we need to give this land to, to the residents of this community that had experienced such hurt and harm over the 30 some years that the incinerator had been um, working. We saw a complete community destroyed. We saw a high rate of asthma. We saw children being impacted. Uh, going to the emergency room consistently, we saw a, a elementary school where 
the children sat right across the freeway from the incinerator. We saw a low income community where children couldn't go outside and play. People couldn't raise their windows in the summertime. We saw so much hurt and harm over the 30 years of its existence uh, that we are really strongly advocating to the city to give this land to the community once it has been um, abated from any contaminants. Uh, and allow them to choose to do something with the land that is going to bring some redemption to the community members that have chose to stay in that community. I know that was quick and fast, but um, that is the history of how we got recycling in the city. And that was our way of moving towards zero waste Detroit. Uh, I do have to say that the plan that we came up with, the solid waste plan at the time, the new business model, did include a comprehensive solid waste management plan that did include commercial recycling in it. So now that we're doing the commercial recycling, I do feel like we're moving forward in the plan. And now we have to really move forward to capture composting of organic materials into this plan so that um, we can hopefully one day in, this, in the city of Detroit really see zero waste Detroit become really zero waste. Thank you guys for your time. Thanks so much, Sandra. That was, that was really great. Um, always a well of knowledge with the history of all of this. Um, so thanks for, for sharing with us. Um, so without further ado, I will pass it off to Renee to speak about um, our compost initiatives in Detroit. Thanks, Renee. Yeah, absolutely. Hopefully you can all see my screen. Let me get to the, um, the uh, mode. So as Neil said, um, composting is a super weapon, is a secret weapon, and it is a game changer. Um, when we talk about, you know, climate, it has so, so many uh, benefits. And when we take a look at, at what we're focusing on, we really look at composting as a, as a soil-based solution. Uh, we're working and advocating uh, for the development of composting at all scales throughout the city because we need to reclaim the materials. People call it waste. It's really resource, right? And we have vision taking those resources and composting locally so that we'll have the ability to create soil-based um, solutions for our needs, both the municipality as well as us as, as residents and being able to address environmental issues. So we really need a uh, good compost um, enhanced, you know, soils, you know, in our city. Some of the things that we're addressing, you know, you've heard a bit about the environmental impacts. Well, the way we manage land um, and the severity of climate is really disproportionately impacting the quality of life of folks in um, Detroit, as you're hearing. So some of this will sound a little bit like an echo, right? So our soils are low performing. So it's gonna affect our food, the flooding, uh, because it doesn't absorb waters well, uh, pollution because it's not absorbing the sediments. It doesn't have the structure and the capacity um, well to do these things, even protecting our air, and as we see more of these hot days in, in uh, Michigan, as which we, we are um, using compost to help plant trees and other land applications to address these um, high heat incident effects on our community. People get deeply affected by that. We have a gap in our system. We don't have adequate capacity right now. Uh, Detroit has the most eaters in the state. We've got over 600,000 folks who live here. And, and that's not even counting all the people who visit and worship and play and all of that. Um, so we don't have enough capacity right now to be able to collect all of that and process all of that and create um, the solutions that we need. So our approach needs to be hyper-local. We have to take a change approach that's hyper-local so we can really optimize the materials. Because right now, you know, the materials that used to get burned, the majority of them in the incinerator are now leaving the city and going to the land field. And there are some things making their way out in compost, but it's a very small, small percentage. So we really need to look across our city and create an integrated decentralized system of diverse scales. And when we do that, 
in, in, in various different size facilities, we're able to network across our districts and to our neighborhoods. Um, Neil showed a slide about the jobs. Yes, we, or uh, maybe it was CAT, jobs generated. Um, because we're moving the material local, there's less emissions associated with that. And the application is gonna get us much, much better soils. So we really have to center collaboration. It's gonna take us working together to collect these materials, to produce this compost and the products that are made from compost so that we can, we can have solutions for ourselves um, to these conditions and improve the quality of life of Detroiters. It's gonna take a lot of us these are a bunch of the folks that I've worked with over the last, you know, six years or so, seven years. Well, actually, it's been almost nine years. I feel like I've been carrying a baby, right? Like, it takes nine months. I feel like I'm carrying a compost baby. You're having this baby now, right? And it takes all of us. It takes a lot of people to do this all across our world. You heard that in my intro. But locally, we're building the Detroit compost movement. Um, so you see um, uh, some of our folks here. Uh, um, when uh, Kat introduced us, we talked about the, the uh, Michigan, our, our composting for community health. So you see the work, you see Michelle Jackson there and, and uh, Brie Free Detroit, you know, working for just transitions from incineration using compost as an act of resistance and others. We work with Wayne State. So there's a lot of ways to get here. Um, uh, there's no one cookie cutter way. Uh, there are a variety of ways to do it. Uh, we had an amazing uh, success out the gate uh, with, I put together pilots, pilot projects, and just kind of matching people together. And one of the matches uh, that we made in the middle of the pandemic in 2020 was a match. Uh, Food Plus worked with Wayne State and Georgia Street Community Collective to build compost programs. The university had been trying for the longest, hadn't been able to do it successfully, partnered together, uh, we were able to build an amazing program. And as of January, we had we had transported in, in just a little bit, like right around two, just shy of two years, uh, 31,000 pounds in five gallon buckets, you know, from the university's campus into our community. So it's an amazing proof of concept that you can partner and develop really strong uh, work um, together. We're very, very excited about that. Uh, one of the things that came out of that, because in addition to when we first did this, we were doing this all on the farm. We were doing uh, a farm-based system to do a proof of concept that it could work. Well, yeah, there's a lot of eaters at Wayne State, right? So you're going to need to build some capacity. So one of the things out of building this, we trained people how to collect clean. We trained uh, people how to compost. And then as we started to continue to build a relationship with Wayne State, uh, Mark Covington and I decided to develop this partnership and, and to create a new facility. And we're in the process of developing that. Why am I telling you that? Because the genesis started with a little pile. <laughs> it started with a pile, right? On a farm, in a corner, right? And so there's so many ways for us to get here and it's really gonna take all of us. Um, there's a frame I like to use when I talk about this work. Um, as, as Kat said, I'm a systems process and change professional. So that shows up no matter what I'm doing, right? So when I look at how do we build, what's an approach to building a compost system? Three elements, I call them the three EPs. We have to have an able policy, an able public and an able practice. What do I mean by that? With policy, we have to have policies that are gonna allow us, first of all, to compost, you know, and to do it right fit it for diverse scales and methods that we would use. So what I do in my backyard, what you do at your home uh, <clears throat> household level, different than what we would do at a community scale, different than what we would do at an industrial scale. So we need to take a close look at our existing policies and to right fit them for diversity uh, in the way that we compost and in all the scales that are possible. Because the biggest impact we could have is you could do it in your backyard. But everybody's not gonna do that. So we gotta do some community, we gotta do some business, we gotta do some different things. Then we have to have an able public. So we as citizens and folks who live in the area and other stakeholders, we really have to understand why is this important? Why do we need to stop sending food waste to the landfill? We no longer send the yard waste, we still send them paper and things like that. But it's important to improve the quality of life for all of us. This isn't just about us who are excited and have the affinity for this. It's for all of us. And folks, when they understand that, the importance, having the willingness 
to support those who want to do it. If somebody wants to do it in your community or wants to do a business or even our government, you know, building programs to support us and doing it on behalf of all of us, we need people to understand that it's important and to be willing to support that. And then enable practice. As I like to say, in short, people got to know what the heck they do. We got to know how to compost well. You need to be educated and trained. Compost does not just happen. Contrary to what some people believe, just put it over there, it's going to happen. But that's Mother Nature's version of it. But we do all kinds of stuff with food scraps, with food. So we really need to process and learn how to do it well and do best practices. That was highlighted in our sustainability action agenda, um, action number 30. And also, we need to operate our sites with authentic consideration for the things around us. So just being aware of how to best design your site, how to best operate your site. So we have to have an able policy, an able public, and an able practice. And we want to center our work around solutions. So a lot of times we first start talking about these, start talking about compost, and people are, you know, we have feelings about that. We talk about composting. Um, but when we talk about the benefits of compost, then now we can get to our solutions. You know, in our food system, we have to be able to have the soils. We need to collect this uh, material all along the way from the moment you drop that first seed and we collect, you know, things from the farm all the way to the last eater. And we need to also address our water system. Compost is amazing in its ability to absorb water. So we need to apply it in those places where the droughts, where the uh, floods are happening where we put have erosion along our waterways. We need to use it to help us keep our waters clean. And also on land, uh, we're planting trees to reduce the heat effects in our city. Uh, we are developing new things. We're taking down old things. When you do both, you need to deal with that landscape and make sure it is it has quality soil, beneficial soil uh, for those next uses along the way, as well as our roads. So we really need to build and center around system solutions. We also want to center equitable participation. Uh, when we look at this, if we look at the traditional approaches oftentimes in the waste industry, you end up with two big operators and one hauler company, two hauler companies, and, and you're done, right? Um, with decentralizing and having a diverse set, you can have people who can provide composting services uh, within our city. You can have people who can be customers because we can get to more people. You can get a deeper impact driving into the neighborhoods and we can all benefit more from being able to use composting or have compost accessible. Right now, a lot of folks that need it, we have to go outside our city miles and miles to get the material. So we need to center around equitable participation. We also need to center place. So everybody's backyard, not just somebody's backyard. I'm flipping the script because Composting has such amazing power. When it's done well, there's lots and lots of benefits. And we all want to benefit from being able to be operators, being able to be service providers, being able to have those services at your, at your, at your door uh, in your neighborhood. So not just the people that are well off, but even in our disadvantaged and, and communities underserved, done right, it becomes a benefit to us in all of our neighborhoods, not you know, the neighborhoods where people have stayed and lay for a long time, not just where the newcomers are. We need to do it in all of our neighborhoods. And I talk about centering people. At the end of the day, this is about the quality of life of us as people. So what does it mean to you to do this through a diversity, uh, equity and inclusion lens? And I talk about equity creates pathways for including everyone. Equity means it's gonna be accessible. Equity looks at diversity because of a variety of people. So look at it when we're building our operations as composters, uh, not just compost operations, but the hauling and all the people in that ecosystem, who's working here, how are we finding our folks, the people nearby in our communities, having relationships. So having a community-centric approach, looking at and knowing and, and that consideration I talked about uh, with the people in your neighborhood, as well as your customers, and then supporting, the, all the support systems around us, because all of us ask our friends and family first when we're doing stuff, help us out, you know, right? And then the service providers, as well as the funders, looking at this from an equity standpoint, ensure that we do this well. And then I'm just going to give you a little bit of my own secret view about this, right? So my view centering equity is really, I say equity is cold for love. It's all about how we care for one another, how we treat one another. 
So when we lead with love and we care about each other, we're going to do things that are beneficial to each other. So lead with love and love others. Um, and lead, lead by example. Start to look at the various different ways that you can do it yourself. You can support other people doing it um, and do it so that it's for the common good. So everybody can benefit. And staying focused on those who oftentimes have the least resources and ability to engage, making sure that we include them, that they're not, that they're not left out and that we find ways to overcome the things that tend to push people out into the margins and provoke folks while you're at it. You know, get other people to do it, provoke them to do it in loving ways that is considerate of each other and to do these good works. It's gonna take all of us. I was inspired um, last year, um, I, I'm actively involved with the US Compost Council. And last year I had the opportunity to speak um, during the conference. I received uh, some recognition there. And I get a lot of things, inspiration and downloads, right? And I got this download and this was I'm gonna leave you with. Composting is love. One thing makes another thing. So life is sustained. So it's up to us. What does our next look like? I'm really looking forward to hearing your voices to see what it is you think about this effort to change the game in, in climate through compost. Thank you. Thank you so much, Renee. Um, always great to hear your, your knowledge about compost. It's, it's really inspiring. Um, and so, yeah, with that, I will pass it off to our final panelists, uh, Maddie Krause, to speak more to what the city is currently working on to advocate for zero waste. So go for it. Thanks, Maddie. Thanks, Kat. Um, I'm going to try to keep this as short as possible because there's supposed to be a Q&A session. So I'm just going to run through these. And if you've got, if you want me to expand on anything that I touch on, feel free to put something in the chat or ask afterwards. Um, so I'm Maddie Krause, I'm the recycling coordinator in the solid waste division. Um, if it were up to me, we wouldn't be called the solid waste division. We'd be called something a little bit more creative, but um, I like to think of myself as a zero waste strategist and the community's guy on the inside. Um, so what I do in the city um, is very exciting. I get to work with community members a lot um, and some of these wonderful community organizations. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about state and national context, um, our current waste diversion goals, How are you? Yeah, you. Detroit Recycles Partners and Programs, and some of the priorities and guiding stars that I use in my work. Um, so for the statewide and national context, you can see in this chart here, Detroit's recycling rate targets and compared to Michigan's targets. So um, ours are a little less aggressive, as we've seen, um, but we kind of lead along the same trend line. Um, we do have, you know, 30% goal by 2029. I like to say 30 by 30. I think it's a little catchier. Um, but, you know, we'd, we'd love to see more. We would love to see that growing exponentially. And I'm actively always looking for opportunities, applying for grants, and trying to find ways that we can capture the recyclables and the compostables that are available in the city. Um, Next Cycle did a 2021 gap analysis um, that showed that nearly 47% of available recyclables and compostables are from originating in SEMCOG, which Detroit is the physically largest city um, and represents about 14% of the population in that region. And so there's clearly a lot of opportunity here for us to be capturing more material. And um, to pull from Gaia's own Tale of Five Cities report, um, you can see here that Detroit in their recycling rates of plastic we don't compare to comparable cities. We're not doing enough. Um, and so we're always trying to push the envelope um, and try to do more, trying to capture more and divert more. Um, so what are those goals? Well, we had a sustainability action agenda that was published in 2019 that listed five goals for our strategies to reduce the waste that we send to landfills. Um, we're doing pretty good so far. I'd say we've launched our citywide recycling campaign. Um, we've expanded curbside recycling to include multifamily buildings and public spaces and city facilities and commercial buildings. Um, some things we haven't done a great job of is working on compost. Um, and that is just 
the nature of the fact that this role is recycling coordinator and it's been very program programmatically focused on recycling. But I think that our recycling programs are in a really great growing place that the city is ready to start moving forward with supporting decentralized composting throughout the city. The last thing we want to do is come in and step on the incredible work that community organizations like Renee's are, are doing. Um, and we really want to find ways to work together and to support that decentralized goal, but also look at the, the larger systems and try to build that capacity as a whole um, from the state and the regional perspective as well. So what is Detroit Recycles programming? What do we offer? Um, well, first I want to acknowledge our partners, Green Living Science, Zero Waste Detroit via Michigan Environmental Council. Um, they are our education contractors. So they are our feet on the street, um, organizing and making sure that Detroiters are aware of recycling, uh, that they know how to get a free recycling bin to their doorstep because um, it is an access and an equity issue. And we really prioritize that and CAT focused on Recycle Here. Um, it's really a, a great movement that started from the grassroots um, and now has been adopted within the city. So, um, you know, we're, I'm just lucky to be on this stage, uh, standing on the shoulder of these giants. Um, some other recycling partners that we work with, WM and GFL Environmental are our curbside haulers. You can see the split that they have across the city. And we do own a couple of our own recycling trucks. Uh, so if you see these running around um, Tuesdays and Thursdays, we've got a couple of recycling routes. We take all of our uh, materials to the Rossoff facility, the community facility over on 8 Mile, where it's all sorted um, from a single stream uh, container into many different types of bales. Um, just briefly wanted to show you guys what's acceptable in that single stream system. Um, all of our programs are the same um, on what's acceptable, except for in our parks. Um, so now breaking it down by some metrics for our Detroit Recycles programming. Um, we have 36 commercial customers. It started in 2021, and in 2022, we had a 134% increase in tonnage from our commercial program. Um, these are the bins available, and again, a picture of our trucks. We also have 84 municipal buildings. Uh, does that picture look familiar? That's what I'm doing right now. Uh, we went into all of our municipal buildings. We made sure that our staff, our city employees knew how to recycle, knew how to find their recycling carts, and we helped them set it up. Um, and our community partners were a big part in that. Um, here you can see a picture. We now have recycling containers at golf courses. I don't know if any of you like to golf as much as I do, but it's something you rarely ever see. But those containers are always full of bottles and cans. So really excited about that project in particular. Um, and as of right now, we have 13 city parks that are recycling out of 300. So we have a long way to go, but we are working on it. Uh, we have a grant right now that we are using to procure some EV trucks and electric utility vehicles uh, that we can service these containers with. Um, and you can recycle bottles and cans in these uh, park containers. Um, as was mentioned earlier, we have about a 39% participation rate. So that means 39% of single family homes and homes with three, four or less units have recycling carts. We average about 7,000 new carts in households every year over the past several years. And we do have an opt-in program right now, which means that residents have to specifically request containers. Um, but we're hoping to pilot an opt-out program this year. We're still waiting on our grant agreement. Um, however, we're really excited to explore a new opportunity to make curbside recycling more accessible and equitable. And here is a photo of where all of our containers are as of right now. You can see there's definitely some gaps. You can see where those pilot areas Sandra was talking about may or may not be. Um, and we're really excited to continue expanding and um, switching up our program to really improve it. Uh, so I have my last slide here that again, I wanna make sure we have time for a couple of questions. Um, priorities and guiding stars, access and equity, I can't say it enough. Um, everyone should be able to recycle. It's free to use for curbside, it's easy, it's you know cheaper than buying a Tesla, right? So we wanna make sure that everyone can do something that is easy and simple to help the environment, to help us achieve our goals. Um, and that comes with education and awareness. We really focus on making sure that we can get the word out there um, and being accountable and transparent. So if you are ever having issues with your recycling program, highly recommend reaching out to me, reaching out to your hauler, um, we always encourage you to 
hold us accountable um, because I don't know it's a problem if someone doesn't tell me that it's a problem. So please reach out to me anytime. Um, and then also Zero Waste Foundation, exploring food waste. Um, how can the city use and produce compost? How can we reduce food waste um, from source um, and hard to recycle materials? I have a vested interest in construction and demolition waste, um, wood waste, things like mattresses or you know other very difficult materials to collect and to recycle. Um, and then also data collection and analysis. The more data we can get, the, the better, right? But it becomes unmanageable at a certain point. And so we're always trying to improve those systems and to improve the type of data that we're collecting. So here's my contact information. I'm gonna turn it back over. Um, so hopefully we can get at least a couple of questions in, but thank you all so much for being here. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Maddie. And happy to stay on for a few extra minutes. I know that we said that the webinar would end at 6.30, but if there's some burning questions, happy to stick around. Um, I did identify a few questions in the chat that haven't been responded to. Um, so I might just pitch them to the panelists, but I do wanna thank um, our panelists again for your incredible presentations and your work and the time that you've taken out of your busy schedules to be here. Um, so one of the questions that came up, and I think this one would be great for you, um, Sandra, would, it, what is a consent judgment if you're able to summarize that in a few words, which I know is going to be challenging, but let's <laughs> ask you that question. Okay, so a consent judgment is a judgment that is entered by our state uh, attorney general against a polluting facility that ups their fine from what the normal fine is and what the consent judgment does is assess a greater fine against a polluting facility than what Eagle would um, assess them for. It's more enforcement of a fine than what Eagle does because it becomes a legal, uh, a legal fight at that point. Um, and for for clarification, Eagle is the um, the Department of Environment, and Great Lakes and Energy, which is our environmental department in Michigan. For anyone who doesn't know the acronym, um, and I was gonna say, <laughs> see, I'm from the old school. We had MDQ, MDQ, the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality. So I just say Eagle because I'm still an MDQ person. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was it was a recent shift. Um, yeah, thanks for your insight, Sandra. Another one, another question that came up um, is, you know, do local compost units smell or produce odor locally? I feel like this is something you demystify and advocate for all the time, Renee. So I'll yeah. let you jump in on that one. Absolutely. So what I want to say is compost done well or compost done wrong has the same results regardless of scale. If you don't do it right in your backyard, you don't know how to bring the materials together because you need to mix, you know, uh, food waste with carbons and things of that nature. You need to need to organize it in a certain way so it can break down. I don't care if you do that in your backyard or you do it in a large scale. If you don't know how to hot compost properly, it can stink. Because think about it, when you cook something, it's a, it's a process of heating up and breaking down. Um, it has to have the right kind of mixes in order for that to happen. It can be done very, very well. Um, as well as you asked about the odors, the same thing uh, with pests and things of that nature. It's all about the way you do it because the animals smell. And if you have mixed that in, they can't smell it. So they can't find it. They're looking for food. They're not coming over there. And same thing with the smells. It has to be done well. That's why we focus on the first step, teaching people how to collect clean and then the composters how to mix properly. So you collect clean as a generator and we mix properly when we bring it into our systems. So those are the ways that we manage to do this well. Thanks so much, Renee, um, for your insights on that. Um, another question that came up from um, Irma was the hazardous waste streams that the city manages through US Ecology. Um, maybe Maddie, you'll have some thoughts on this, but I wanted to quickly jump in and mention that a part of that stream is electronics that get um, sent to uh, human IT that actually process uh, mechanically as much as possible those um, electronics. As for the other streams, it is a little tricky to be calling that diversion because I think a lot of that hazardous waste actually winds up in sanitary landfills. 
Um, but Maddie, you managed a lot of that data, so I'll let you jump in on that one a little bit. No, I think you really hit all of the major salient points there um, in regards to what that stream looks like. Um, we do get pretty broken down data about what types of hazardous waste we get. And I will say that we're pretty fortunate to have a facility that's open as frequently as it is, because often many municipalities only offer drop-offs every, you know, once every three or four months. Um, so it, it really is a, a convenience. Um, as much as we wish we could divert some of that hazardous material, we don't have the systems in place right now to do so necessarily. So um, hopefully that answers your question. And we could do a whole deep dive on the environmental injustices of those facilities. And we have some key players um, here with us tonight, and that could be a whole other webinar just on that. Um, Wish we had more time, but um, I, there are some folks here that I'm sure would be happy to answer more questions on that. Um, I see a hand up from Neil. <clears throat> uh, yes, hi everybody. Um, <clears throat> uh, it is good to be here and to see so many old friends and learning a whole lot. Um, <clears throat> uh, and I want to congratulate uh, 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 Kat, uh, uh, excuse me, not Kat, but Maddie. Uh, that was a great presentation on DC. And Renee, I'm going to start quoting you, compost is our secret weapon. That's terrific. <clears throat> great communications. Um, um, my, uh, I just wanted to mention that um, the, uh, <clears throat> the project we're working on with, with um, uh, Deborah Stewart-Anderson and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Michelle Jackson, um, is having a meeting on February 21. I believe it's a zero waste Detroit uh, project. And um, <clears throat> I am going to be on it and my, I'm going to focus exclusively on the types of jobs uh, that we think can be created uh, and the number of jobs for each of the very specific uh, waste streams, uh, not waste streams, but recycle streams that we have from organics to uh, electronics and, and so forth. And so I'm really looking forward to uh, getting uh, further into detail and look forward to seeing people again soon. Thank you. And thanks for putting this on. Thanks so much, Neil. Um, appreciate your comments. Um, are there any other questions that have emerged in the last few minutes that anyone would like to share with our panelists? Um, and we, some of us shared our email addresses in the, in the chat if you all would like to reach out with further questions. Yeah, I think there's a question in the chat from Irma asking uh, Neil uh, Tangri if uh, you can speak at all to hydrothermal liquid liquefaction process for waste from sewage as that's something that has been proposed to be studied here in uh, our city of Detroit. Thanks. Uh, the short answer is no. <laughs> so sewage sludge is definitely a problematic um, uh, waste stream to deal with. Um, I'm not familiar with hydrothermal liquefaction myself. Um, I will say that my general bias when it comes to these things is that there's not a lot of money for waste management. And so when we talk about extremely expensive advanced technologies, um, good luck really rolling them out on a significant basis. And I think that um, when it comes to sewage, we need to look for some other um, solutions. There's some work that's been done with like living machines. There's some work in Ohio actually um that you know uh uses plants and phytoremediation um and much more uh kind of nature-based solutions to deal with sewage um and that might be a better way to go but sorry i can't speak uh to the technical details of that technology if i can jump in on that i also don't have any technical details but i think that your point about the cost of very expensive um you know new innovations um, from the city's perspective, we're spending more money than ever on our waste system since the incinerator was shut down, which was obviously a huge push in the right direction. But now we're, we didn't have a good replacement process um, in place. And so we're kind of scrambling, right? We didn't 
necessarily bring on all of the the big new shiny technologies all at once because it, it's very difficult to do so. I mean, tomorrow, if I could, I'd have recycling bins at every single household, but the realistic point of view is that there's hundreds of thousands of households that don't have recycling bins and that I don't have the funds to be able to distribute them. So very large part of my job is applying for grant funding, which is how a lot of these types of um, innovations would be funded if they were housed under the city. Um, so any type of private investment in uh, new and advanced technology, um, I would encourage with obviously a, a mind for what are the communities we're putting these technologies in and how will they impact the surrounding communities. And so again, I have no technical knowledge about the process, but um, want to encourage innovation, especially on the private level. Thanks so much for those insights, Maddie and Neil. Um, one one more opening question that I'll uh, defer to panelists for is, um, will there be any other follow-up meetings planned at the local level that people should be made aware of, knowing that from a Gaia perspective, like what we're hoping is that this case study um, is gonna be leveraged at the local level for advocacy efforts. Um, so just deferring to you all about local events. Well, Neil did did uh, tell everyone about the uh, meeting on the the Zero Waste Detroit meeting on the twenty first. That everyone is welcome to. I will get that information. I'll try to pull that information into the chat unless you have it, Neil, right now. Uh, for those that would love to join the meeting, um, so I will try to get that information over. Hey. Uh I'll yeah, uh, Sandra, good good to see you. I, I don't have it handy, but um, I will make sure someone gets it to you. I can get it in the chat right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I was going to try to get it in there too. Appreciate it. Um, I will say if you are interested in being more involved to um, get in touch with the Green Task Force, join a Green Task Force committee that you care about. We've got a recycling and waste reduction. We've got a composting and organics waste reduction. Um, there's even energy solutions and transportation. I mean, there is a whole host of Green Task Force meetings um, that you can join. And the city will be hopefully under, uh, undergoing some pre-planning for a zero waste plan um, so that we can have, you know, a, a pretty good strategy laid out ahead of us. Um, and that's not something that's started yet, but um, we're looking forward to starting it. So if you're interested in learning more about that, feel free to reach out to me. So I'm just sharing a link to the um, Green Task Force committees um, and for anyone who'd be interested in learning more about these. Um, so it's 640. Um, I want to give maybe another three seconds if there's a, a last burning question that emerges, but um, I just want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Um, this definitely feels like a milestone for me. <laughs> Um, it took a while to get here, so I'm really um, thankful, and I hope that I can continue to support this work in whatever way that I can, um, and that the case study will will live on and hopefully become a living document um, in Detroit. And of course, thank you, KT, for all the back of house that you've been doing. Uh, we wouldn't have been able to do this without you, so thank you for for being here as well. Um, so with that, I think, uh, I think we'll, we'll log off. This is like, okay. yeah, I'm going to try to, I'm putting the, yeah. zoom, I'm putting the zoom link, uh, for the zero waste Detroit coalition meeting in the chat. I'm okay. also, I also wanted to say that we're going to be in person at the art block location on hold on Holden. So okay. I'll put it for those that's left. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, Deborah. Thanks for coming out. Sure thing. Thanks so much, everyone. I'm gonna I'm gonna repost Maddie's uh, post. I think because you had put the Zoom link, Maddie. Yep, the Zoom link and the address to Art Block is in the chat. Okay, great. 
Thank you. Appreciate You're it. Welcome, Deborah. Thank you all. Thanks so Congratulations, much. Congratulations, Pat. <laughs> Thanks, Maddie. I appreciate you. Have a great one, everyone. Have a good night. Thanks to both Kat, KT, and Gaia for this. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for the data. Bye, now. everyone.